All right, section 2.2, we started last time describing sets. And we had gotten to the point where we had talked about all these wonderful symbols um, that we're going to use. And you won't use all of them, and you certainly won't use a lot of them much of the time. But there's some of them that will come out over and over again. Um, the first two, the element and not an element symbol, those are going to come up a lot. Um, the whole numbers and the natural numbers, those are going to come up a lot. And at the very end of the semester, we're going to see that integers one come up as well. So those are the ones we're going to see the most. So what we're going to do next is we're going to do some examples on actually writing um, with these symbols. So the first one says that we're going to talk about the natural numbers. Um, so please remember with me, do natural numbers include zero? No. Okay, I always have people try to remember what, where their zero counts or not. Zero is not a natural number. And sometimes the natural numbers are referred to affectionately as the counting numbers. So if that helps you to sort of think about it that way, they're the ones you start counting with. All right, so we're supposed to write down all the natural numbers less than five. The listing or the roster method is the one where it starts out with those beautiful curly braces, and we simply list everything that fits that criteria. So what is the first natural number less than five? One. And then what do I have? Two, three, four. Do I get to use five? No, because it said less than. If it said less than or equal to, I could use five. All right, set builder notation, which we talked about um, a little bit last time. Starts with a curly brace as well. You write down X and a bar. There's two more pieces of information that you have to include, and they could be listed in either order. The one that's usually listed first is the inequality description. This one said that X, the number, is less than five. That's usually how you'll see this listed first. And then you have to say what kind of number, because if you stop there, it means that you would have things like negative 2 and 3.7 and, for heaven's sake, pi, right? You'd have all of that stuff, and that's not what you're supposed to have. You're only supposed to have 1, 2, 3, and 4. So you need to tell us that the x value is an element of the natural numbers. And again, if you wanted, you could switch the order of these two, and that would be acceptable as well. Okay, is that good? Yes. For what purpose and in what circumstance would you use this curly? Well, the listing roster method is really supposed to be a list of all values. What if this question said the natural number is greater than five? It's actually not possible to list those. Or what if it talked about the rational numbers? less than, greater than, I don't care, there's no, I mean, I can't, it's not physically possible to list those out. So the second method comes into play when you have things that really are impossible to list out. So yeah, it's not a great example for the second method on this one, but in order for me to do an example that actually works at all for both of them, I had to create an example like that. Does that help? Yes. Okay. All right. Some vocabulary. Equal versus equivalent. I don't know about you, but in English, when we say equal and we say equivalent, we mean the same thing. And in mathematics, we're not going to mean the same thing. Equal sets are two sets that contain exactly the same elements. That's equal. Equivalent sets, which is on the next sheet of paper for you, we'll skip it for just a second, so flip to the next sheet of paper, is two sets for which there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. I'll talk about that in a minute. But the kicker is that the sets have the same number of things. Right? Well, again, I'm, I promise we'll talk about the one-to-one -one thing. But equivalent means they have the exact same elements, the same stuff. I'm sorry, thank you. E equal means they have exactly the same stuff. Equivalent means they have the same number of stuff. So let me give you an example, and we'll talk about where this one-to-one -one comes into play. If my husband and I were both to talk to you about our family, there are six people in our family. We would list the exact same people that are in our family. I'm thinking like the people that reside in my home and kind of thing, right? It's the same family. Those are equal sets. If I and my sister did that, we have the same number of people in our households, but not the same people, right? I have six people in my house, just six people in her house. Those would be equivalent sets, but they're not equal sets. 
So where does this one-to-one -one correspondence comes into play? Well, the one-to-one -one correspondence comes into play when, when you talk about matching people up or matching elements up. There's a one-to-one -one matching. So if my sister and I were to get together with my family and her family together, and we all paired up with a buddy, we'd each have a pair, right? You know, the husbands could talk, the wives could talk, the brothers could talk, the sisters could talk. We'd have this way to compare people and pair them up one-on-one -on -one in a way that would make sense. That's how the equal number comes into play, is that there's this pairing that can happen. The picture that you'll see happen a lot of times when a description is made about this, that's a little bit bigger than I wanted, just a sec, is you'll see two groups listed, and you'll see, say, we'll do three items in them. It doesn't matter, matter really how many. And the first one is, say, A, B, C. And the second one is, say, one, two, three. And there's some kind of a correspondence. So maybe A goes to one, and maybe C goes to two, and maybe B goes to three. Everybody has a pair. Everybody has a partner. You can all dance or something like this, right? All right, so the, first, the next question we're going to take a look at, example two, says, how many one-to-one -one correspondences are there between two sets with six elements? Now, I can't really very easily draw a picture for this, right? I can start the picture, and then I'm going to show you very quickly where things go amok. You want me to show you? So here's what happens. We've got a group of six things. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, like the six people in my family. And we get together with the six people in my sister's family, and I'm going to have correspondence, and we're going we're to make some kind of a correspondence there. People are going to have conversations. So there are six people in the other family. I don't want to list them one to six because I don't want to confuse the issue, so I'm going to use letters A, B, C, D, E, and F. Well, person number one could talk to A, or they could talk to B, or they could talk to C, or they could talk to D, or they could talk to E, or they could talk to F. But once we make that comparison with those two people together, so person number one had how many people they could talk to? Six. But once that pair is made, person number two can't pick that same person. Right? So let's say that person number one matched up with partner A. Well, then person number two can't choose partner A. They've already been chosen. All right? So this picture... I can't even finish drawing it because I don't know which choice person one made. So I can't even draw the lines from two on because it depends on what happened to person number one. So all of a sudden I'm at a loss to, do what to know what to do with my picture. So my picture is going to sort of stop right there. And what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to list out options. So here's my six people. Now I'm going to list like this. So these are the same six people. The first person is person number one. The second person is person number two and so forth. What I'm going to write on top of the line is I'm going to write how many choices they have. Okay? Person number one, how many choices do they have? Six. But once they've made their choice, or once that pairing has happened, and person number two is ready to make that choice, how many options does person number two have? Five. And person number three? And then? and then, and then one, right? So now what do I do with this six, five, four, three, two, one? Any guesses? It's either multiply or add. Those, those are kind of our two thoughts, right? So which one's the right one? It's multiply. It's multiply. And I'm gonna go back to my example with three elements to show you why it's multiply. Um, so this actually ends up being the number 720 when you multiply it, just so you know. Okay, um, I'm going to go back a slide where I had this picture over here, and we're just going to list out pairings, okay? So we could pick one pairing would be that A goes with one, and then B goes with who? Two, and then automatically means C goes with three. But I could have chosen A going with one and B going with three and C going with 
two. And this is all of the ways, so this is option one, this is option two. These are all of the ways that A can be paired with one, correct? But A didn't have to be paired with one. A could have been paired with two. If A is with two, B could be with one, or C could, and then C has to be with three. But it could be that A is with two and B is with three and C is with one. So again, here's option three and four. That's all the ways that we could do this with A pairing with two. But A doesn't have to be paired with one or two. It could be paired with three. And then B would be with maybe one and C would be with two or A could be with three, B could be with two and C could be with one. There's our fifth and our sixth option. Now, if I had written this out the way I did on the previous, or the, the subsequent slide, three options, person number one has three choices, person number two has two choices, person number one has one choice, the only way I'm going to get six options is if I multiply three times two, not add, right? Do you know what we just did? Well, we actually have a name for this later. We'll get to when you guys take... Um, Proportional and statistical reasoning. You've already had that one, haven't you? Um, but what we just did is we simplified this to an easier case. Do you remember our problem solving strategies? One of our problem solving strategies is to examine a simpler case. That's what we just did. We examined the simpler case of three items instead of six items to try and figure out which we should have done multiply or add. It's multiply. All right? Okay, a little bit more vocabulary then. Cardinal number. Cardinal number just means the number of items in a set. Cardinal means it's not the bird today. Okay? Number of items in the set. It is written, so if the set is S, then the cardinal number um, notation is written N of S. Kind of like that notation because N reminds me of number. So when you see N of S, it doesn't mean the items that are in S, it means how many items are in S. So if we put N hands family this would be six it wouldn't be dr. hands Jeff hands Abby hands Lisa hands we wouldn't list the people out because this notation means number of people number of elements a set whoops a set for which the cardinal number is a whole number it's called a finite set, and it could be awfully large, but it's finite. It means that in some sense it can be, um, we, can, we can write down a number associated with it. So if I can write down the number, I've got a finite set. It doesn't even mean that it's like something I could physically count. Um, in my other class, I bring in a book that's called How Much is a Million? And you physically cannot count to a, to a, to a billion. We'll even just start with that one. It's not physically possible. You will die before it happens. Okay? But that doesn't mean it's not finite. It is finite. It has a numerical value. I can write it down. Okay? Um, infinite simply means that it isn't actually even able to be written a number down for. And you've all seen the symbol for infinity, I'm sure, before. But it's something, like if we talked about just a minute ago, Gretchen, when you were asking about that other notation, if I talked about um, the natural numbers where I had that open-ended, you know, Devin, those numbers stop, <coughs> excuse me, that would be an infinite set. Because it doesn't stop, I can't actually write down a number. And, and I'm sure you guys have had this sort of weird conversation somehow with somebody. And it, for me, it would have been my brother um, somewhere along the way where he says something like, um, I hate you to infinity. And you say, I hate you infinity squared or something like that, right? Or infinity times infinity or infinity plus infinity. I don't even care what number you use. It doesn't even sort of make sense, but somehow you're in your mind, you're thinking even more than that, Right? This is that kind of an idea. So that's an infinite set. The last one is an empty or a null set. Um, this is a set that contains no elements. It has a cardinality of zero. And there are two ways that it can be written. You can write a zero with a slash through it. Um, this is why I always cringe when people actually put a slash through their zeros is because that notation means something different. Um, a couple of things, actually, in mathematics. It means when in set theory, which is what we're doing, it means null or empty set. Uh, when you're working inside of algebra, it means no solution. 
it doesn't mean zero. So if you, if you are in the habit of writing slashes through your zeros, please stop, okay? Um, this means no, uh, the null set. Um, it has one other notation, which is also kind of friendly. It doesn't use it as often, but it's curly braces that there's nothing inside of them. Please do not mix these notations and mush them together. Don't write a curly brace with the empty set symbol inside of it. That actually means something different too, okay? So don't mix the notations. There are two notations. You can use either one of them if you were describing it, but they mean a set with nothing in it. Okay, so here's what I want you to do first. Right underneath there, there's this tiny little space. I want you, hang on, maybe I'll do this later before I get carried away. Oh no, I do get it, do it later. We'll come back to it, okay? So um, a null set, I want to give you a null set example, and then there's one at the very end we'll do. In fact, you know what, let's just jump to it. We're going to do things all out of order because I feel like I'm being a rebel today. So a null set. Um, I'm going to give you an example of a null set, and then I'm going to have you guys write one down as example number whatever is the last one today. Um, a null set would be the babies in my house. The babies in my house are amazing. They never cry, never have to change their diaper. They are the best babies that you would ever possibly imagine because they don't exist. I used to use the example of teenagers in my house, and I can't do that anymore. So I had to create the baby example. So babies in my house, okay? So I want you to do this. Flip over here to the last example. And I want you to create a real life example of the null set in your life, okay? So my example, right, is a curly brace that says babies in the hands family. And this is what you're going to do too. Whatever your description is, it's going to be a description of something inside of curly braces. And if you've done it correctly, this is the null set. It's the set with nothing inside of it. Okay, so jot something down there. Somebody give me an example. What you write down? What's a null? A null set in your life. Number of cupcakes in your backpack. That would be messy if there were any, wouldn't it? Yes. Okay, number of cupcakes in your backpack. We wouldn't say number of, though. We would just say cupcakes in my backpack. So, yeah, cupcakes in my backpack. What else? I said Amy's nieces because I have three nephews and my sister's burning with my bag yesterday that's another baby. So. All right, so the nephews that Amy has. Yeah. Let's do one more. Somebody else, a volunteer. Lauren, thank you. Number of boyfriends I have. Always have somebody that does this. Don't put the number of, though. Say boyfriends. Just do the description without the number of, okay? But yes, there you go. Sorry, Lauren's boyfriends. That would be inside the coast. I, almost every semester somebody says that, just so you know. So, yeah. Okay, very good. So these are real-life examples, null life stuff. Or real null examples in your real life. I didn't even say that right. I tried. Okay, this is the example that we're on, actually, example number three. What we're going to do is we're going to find the cardinal number of each of the following sets. Now, some of this feels a little bit like something we already did. I mean, because we did this when we did Gauss's theorem, remember, or not theorem, but his method for, for adding up these numbers together when we counted things. So let's take a look at the first one. How many items are in that set? Do you remember how we did it? It is 99 minus 8. So let me give these sets the names A, B, we always use capital letters for sets, C, and D. And then I can talk about the number of elements in set A. And uh, Amy hit the nail on the head, that's 99 minus 8. So for the first one, it's 91. Okay, and if you just want to write down 91, that's fine. How about the number of items in set B? Two, four, six, eight, up to 2,002. Nope. You could try. There's something else going on you forgot. Yeah, yeah we're going to split it in half. That's right, Jasmine Rose. So we're going to take the 2,002 and divide by 2. So why are we dividing by 2? Does everybody see it now? 
Yeah, it's counting by twos. So this would be 1,001. Very good. How about the number of items in set C? This one looks funny. Don't let the funny freak you out. So why is it 50, or why do you think it might be 50? Okay, we've got odd numbers. What about the x squared? What about that at the beginning? Okay, so the first thing, let me write down the first thing that you guys said so that we don't lose track of it. The first thing people said was that there are 50 numbers here. Do we, does everybody agree that there are 50 numbers here? Yeah, yeah. okay, so there's 50 numbers there because I went from 1 to 100 and I halved it to get the odds. I'd have 50 numbers and that's exactly what my set is, is the odd numbers. Okay, but what about this x squared at the beginning? Well, if 50 equals x, would you do 50 times 2? Well, but 50 doesn't equal x. 50 is the number of x's that I have. Let's try this. I would like for you to write down the first five elements of this set. What's the first element in this set? It is 1. What is the second element in this set? It's not 3. It's 9. Why is it 9? Yeah, so the first one's actually 1 squared, which is 1. The second one is 3 squared, right? It's 9. The third one would be 5 squared, and then the fourth one would be 7 squared, and then I'd have 9 squared, and we would keep going until we get to what? 99 squared. I mean, this is the actual set that I have. There you go. It's the same number of elements. The fact that I'm squaring them does not have any effect on how many of them I have. It changes what they are, right? It's not the same set that I had, but it's the same number of elements in the set. So I still have 50 here, regardless. How about D? D says all x such that x is equal to x plus 1. Can you give me a value for x that would work? What do you think, Amy? Why is it not possible, Hannah? Because you can't add a number, add one to a number, and so expect to get the same number you started with. Right. Because it's a natural number. It's yeah. Be Anytime you add a number, the number one, anytime you add the number one to something, it will change. It doesn't really matter what that number was to begin with. It's going to change if you add one to it, right? It's not going to stay the same. Now, there are things you could add, like if you added zero, something wouldn't change, but I'm told I'm supposed to be adding one. No matter what number I pick, say I picked seven, I'm going to get something different on the other side. It's never going to work. Right? Never going to work. So how many items? What is the cardinality of D? It's zero. D itself is actually what is known as what? The null set. This is an example. This right here actually is the null set. The number of items in it is zero. Okay. Cardinality means number of items, zero, because this is the null set. All right, so quick show of hands. We're about to move into something a little different in this section. Who have worked with Venn diagrams before? Most of you. Very good. Um, I want to show you um, an example. I'm not sure if I can do it from... Well, let me, let's, let's talk about this, and maybe I'll show it at the end of class. Okay, Venn diagrams. So if you haven't used them or if you haven't used them in a while, a Venn diagram is a diagram used to illustrate ideas in logic. Um, 
the earliest that my daughter saw them used was second grade. And she wasn't using them for exactly what we're going to use them for, but that's when she was introduced to the idea of Venn diagrams. The universal set in a Venn diagram is the set that contains all elements being considered in the discussion. It's usually drawn as a rectangle. So you get a rectangle like this. That would be the universal set. It's usually even labeled with a U for what we're going to be doing with it anyway. The complement of a set is the, all of the elements in the universal set that are not in set F. And your book writes it as F with a little bar on the top. I have another textbook that I use um, for contemporary math, the online contemporary math, and it writes it with a prime after it. And there is one other textbook that I have seen that uses a little C for complement after it. These all mean the same thing. What they mean is not F. So if you've got this universal set U and you have a set F that's inside of it, F is here and F complement is out here. It's in the universal set rectangle set F, I mean the rectangle set U, but it's not inside circle F. It's a U. I'll write it a little bit better. U for universal set. How you label F? What do you mean? Oh, do I care which of those symbols you use for complement? I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. You'll see your book using the bar on the top. Um, and when I do it for your, um, is that true? Now I can't remember if I'm actually telling you the right thing. I've been doing contemporary math recently is why. I'm pretty sure it's the complement if they do the bar on the top. I'm pretty sure. Um, but yeah, you could use a different one if you wanted to. It wouldn't hurt anything. Okay. So we're going to do an example, a context cited, kind of content, if you will, example of context, a contextual example. Let's go with that, contextual example of a universal set and a complement. So if we have the universal set U and it's all the students at OBU, you've got a picture in your mind of what that looks like. There's men, there's women, there's freshmen, there's seniors, there's married, there's non-married, there's all this, you know, all these variety of people, okay? And A is the set of all those who are graduating. Then what would the complement of A be? Yeah, and we want to make sure that we say that they're OBU students still, because st we're still talking about OBU students. It still has to be inside of the universal set U, okay? We don't even need to specify their freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, because they're still seniors, too, that sometimes aren't graduating, right? Maybe they're doing a fifth year or something like that. So our set's complement would be OBU students who are not graduating. Okay? All right. The next thing in our discussion of Venn diagrams is the idea of a subset. So a subset is a set where every element inside of it is inside the bigger set we were discussing. So for all sets A and B, B is a subset of A if and only if every element of B is an element of A. And the way that we write it is we put the B first, and we write this symbol that looks kind of like a C, or like a U on its side. It's really more squished than a C looks. But, and then we write this set that's bigger than it. It's including it inside of it on the right. In terms of a Venn diagram, let me show you what this looks like. So you've got yourself that same rectangle for the universal set. 
And then you have set B. And then what you're supposed to have is you're supposed to be having a set that surrounds it. It's bigger than B, or at least as big as B. Contains everything that B contains, and maybe more. You know, B is contained completely inside of set A, completely and totally inside. Now, proper subset goes one step further. I used the phrase just a moment ago, at least as big as. And you probably felt like it was a little awkward, and it sounds and feels a little awkward to say it. But technically, with the definition the way it is, a set is a subset of itself. Every element in A is an element in A. So A is a subset of A. It's not a very exciting subset, right? It's like saying, we're going to have the math department and we're going to have a committee in the math department, but every person in the math department is going to be on the committee. Okay. It seems and feels awkward, but it, by definition, it fits the description of what subset is. So proper subset gets around that awkwardness. And what it does is it says, okay, yeah, yeah, everything in B is in A, fine. But we're also going to say, and more. A really has something else, too. Okay? So it says that at least one element of A is not in B. Okay, something, there's something really in that outer set that makes sense. Okay, so I, I'll, I'll do an example of a family kind of example. Um, I have a um, brother-in-law who has a daughter from a previous marriage, and um, then he's remarried now, and they have three biological children themselves as well. So if they were going to talk about their biological children, my brother-in-law says, I have four biological children, Right? because he has the daughter from before and he has three more. Well, his wife, if she wants to talk about her biological children, would be a proper subset of that because she only has three biological children. Okay, he has one more. He has something in this circle on the outside that's one, at least one more than she does when they talk about it in that fashion. All right, something more, at least one more. There's no different like Venn diagram picture of that. However, there is a different notation for it. What you do is you simply remove the line that's on the bottom. And you almost get the feeling that when you do that, that that line sort of meant or equal to. You know what I'm saying? The first one, we had the ability to be equal to it. It's kind of like when we do the less than and the less than or equal to symbols. We have the ability to be equal to it. Well, when I remove it, that possibility is removed. It truly is larger, set A, than set B was. Number of subsets. If we have a set with n elements, then there are two to the n subsets. There are two to the n minus one. Notice where the minus one is. It's not in the exponent with the n. It's down here beside this, right? Proper subsets. We're going to do an example with that, and then we can talk about what, how that makes sense a little bit um, of what's going on. So there are five faculty members in the mathematics department, five of us. Just use the formulas, then we'll talk about what it means to be subsets, okay? So how many, according to the formulas, proper, I mean, how many subsets are there of the math faculty? What would I do? Two to the fifth. And two to the fifth is, if you guys remember, you can do it really fast in your head. It is 32, very good. So there are 32 subsets of the math department. How many proper subsets are there? That means like sets that wouldn't include everybody. 31. It's just one less. Okay, 31. Okay, so let's talk about what kinds of subsets we could talk about with five people. Well, we could talk about the subset that includes everybody. That's the one that gets excluded at the bottom, right? The, the subset that has all five people in it. It's not a very exciting subset because, like we said, it doesn't really distinguish itself from the whole set, right? We could make groups of four people. Agreed? Any four of the people. And there'd be a lot of those, right? A lot of those, because some of them would include me, some of them would not include me. Right? We have a lot of different groupings of that. Some of them that would include me would include my, my friend Dr. Marsh, and some of them would not include Dr. Marsh, right? We have a lot of different groupings of that. 
we could have groupings that have three elements in them, right? Same thing. A lot of, some of them would include me, some of them wouldn't include me. We could have subsets that include two people in them, right? Because we're all still people in the math department, two groupings. We could have subsets, and this feels a little awkward as well, but we could have subsets that include one person in them. You know, so I am all by myself as a, as a committee. If I'm a committee of one, I'm still a subset of the math department as a committee of one. And then here's the one that feels really awkward. We could also talk about the subset that has nobody in it, the null set. And if you go back to the definition, it fits awkwardly, albeit, but it fits. If you talk about the set that has nothing in it, then everything that's in it is in the original set, right? It is. It's weird, right? But by definition, it fits. I think there's something really wrong with this definition. It just feels really weird when you start thinking what actually works, right? But it works. All right, so let's take a look at one more example I think we have time for, and then we will pause for today. So we're going to suppose that we have a set about which we know that there are 63 proper subsets. What we want to know is how many elements are in the set. What would I have to do to solve this problem? Add one will tell me what? If I add one, what do I, what do I know then? Okay, so if there are 63 proper subsets, then I know that there are 64 subsets total. But that's not exactly what I was asked yet, right? I need to know 2n equals. All right, then what I need to know is I need to know 2 to what to the nth power equals, 2 to what n power equals 64. What would I have to raise the number 2 to to get 64? And it's 6. So there are 6 elements. So this is kind of like the last problem in reverse, right? The last problem we knew the number of elements and we were finding the number of sets or subsets. Um, subsets actually. And then this is when we found the other way around. Alright, we'll stop there for today.